Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Eddie's going to be throwing at me a bunch of the questions you've written in, so stay tuned, inshallah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. I'm Eddie, your host, and you are watching The Dean Show. When we come back, Noman Ali Khan back on The Dean Show. We had him here before. He was the Muslim who turned atheist and back to Islam. You can see that show at thedeanshow.com. Today, he's going to be here with us in The Dean Show studio, answering some of your questions. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome to the Dean Show, and in the Dean Show studio, I have Noman Ali Khan with the CEO of the Baina Institute. Alhamdulillah. How have you been? I'm very good. Alhamdulillah, I've been good. Thank you for finding the time again to be with us. Alhamdulillah, my pleasure. And I got kind of uh, in our last few shows, we promised the viewers that we're going to answer some of their questions. Sure. And in one of them, if people can go to thedeanshow.com and we kind of were given a vivid description about Jannah, paradise, mm -hmm. and I got kind of taken away with that, and we just spun off, and we started talking about the wonderful re rewards for those who humbly try to do what the Creator wants us to do, living in peace and harmony with the commands that, the God, that God Almighty, the Creator, has told us to, to live by, and then we get Jannah, paradise, mm -hmm. so people can go to thedeanshow.com to see that show. We're going to continue on answering some questions, and... We'll start right away with the first one. Sure. Here, talking about how do I um, shape up my character to be of what is pleasing to God. So the person is asking about character. How do I get my character right so God will be pleased with my character? Sure. Um, I think shaping up character, uh, which is a very relevant question, all of us have things that we need to improve in our character. Uh, it requires a person to look deep inside themselves and say, what exactly do I wish I was doing better? Before you even seek more knowledge, are you able to be honest with yourself and be able to make a list for yourself? These are the things I wish I wasn't doing, and these are the things I wish I was able to accomplish in my life. That's number one. And there should be a list of things you could eliminate from your life, and there are a, wish of things, a list of things that you wish you could have added in your life. And of the things you could have eliminated, you have to really now start asking yourself, how do I get rid of this? For example, somebody has a problem with any kind of addiction, be it drugs, alcohol, pornography, whatever it may be, some kind of addiction. Well, these addictions, they usually happen at certain situations. Some young man's home by himself. He gets from, home from school early. Parents aren't home yet. He's got an hour and a half to himself in the house. Guess what? That's when trouble strikes. So you identify, yes, I do this bad thing, but I do it at a particular time in a particular situation. So maybe if I change something about that time and that situation, it'll help me. I know I have a problem at home being by myself. Maybe I need to figure out, maybe I could stay at school later. Maybe I need to fill that time with something more productive. At the end of the day, evil deeds are about a misuse of your time. That's what they boil down to, practically speaking. Is it too much time on your hands? Too much time on your hands. Not, you're not keeping yourself busy enough. I say for young people especially, you brothers and sisters, they need to keep themselves busy. From the moment they keep their, open their eyes until the time they close their eyes, they can't even keep them open anymore. They should be just busy doing stuff. And if, even if that's sports, it, it's okay. It doesn't have to be like you're studying Quran all day. It doesn't have to be that. You can do religious activity, but anything productive. You, you get a job somewhere, you, you start getting an internship, you start doing some research, you get into sports, or whatever it may be, but you're keeping yourself productive. The first thing in fixing our character is getting rid of evil deeds, like I said before, do no harm. Mm -hmm. And part of that is making really good use of your time. I can tell you something personally about myself. My parents left when I was sophomore in college. I used to live in New York City by myself, um, and my parents aren't even here, so nobody looking over my shoulder saying, hey, what you're doing isn't right. And I wasn't even all that religious at the time. But you know what? I stayed out of trouble entirely. Why? Because my day began getting re early morning, getting ready for commute, going to work, going from work straight to school, from school back to work, from back to work. Then I used to go back to the masjid and study some Arabic and then go home. I didn't have time for anything else. Even if I wanted to do messed up things, I couldn't. Because <laughs> I busied myself. And that's one of the big problems I see today is people have, uh, especially our youth, have way too much free time. They don't think they have to do anything. But, but she says, look, I don't have no time. I, you know, I got all these guys calling me. I got three girlfriends, the guy says. I'm really busy. <laughs> <laughs> that means you do have way too much free time. Uh -huh. You know, uh, this is a function of one being in horrible company. 
Okay, so this that's, is not. This is you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. Obviously. Right, obviously. And why does someone end up in that situation? I argue most of the time it's because of our company. The Prophet told us, Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, Al Maru Ala Dini Khalilihi. A person depends on the religion of his friend. Our friends make up who we are. The Arabs have an old wise saying, you know. Uh, tell me who you spend time with, I'll tell you who you are. That's what the Arabs tell mm -hmm. us. You know, it's an old wisdom they have. And it's very true. Who you spend time with is a reflection of who you are. You can't say, man, I got some messed up friends. <laughs> that means you're messed up, buddy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a reflection of who you are. The Prophet told us, A person is a mirror of, their, of his brother. Brother here also means friend. In other words, looking at your friend is like looking in the mirror. So people of good character, if you're hanging out, your character obviously that is going to change. That speaks of your those, character. But you're hanging out with people with bad character, who are having all these girlfriends, or girls that are having all these boyfriends. Then there's no surprise you end up in those things. Mm, yeah. Makes sense. How come, just to roll off, to go off this for, for a second before we go to the next question, why is it so hard, people get motivated to go to a football game, to a basketball game, they get motivated sometimes even play Xbox, but sometimes... You know, when you try to encourage people to get together, we're going to have a khalaqa, right? We're going to uh, talk about a certain topic of Islam, you know, come to my house, or fat, we'll watch a lecture, we'll watch Noman Ali Khan, you know, uh, or someone okay. else. Hopefully something better, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying? Yeah. A lot of times the motivation is not there the same way it is for some of these other, other things. things yeah. Why is that? Have you seen this? Sure. I mean, there's different kinds of people. There, Alhamdulillah, there are people, especially uh, in the Muslim community now, that have found motivation and they're really driven to do things and they get really frustrated because their friends aren't motivated mm -hmm. right first of all you have to be patient with your friends because you weren't always motivated yourself it took a while to get you to a certain point right and you can't give up on your friends you can't say oh they're not motivated forget it I won't even call them the next time no you keep calling them you keep inviting them you pastor them you pastor them you pastor them until you they finally listen this one time because it all all it takes is one reminder coming out of somebody's mouth and by Allah's permission, that reminder is like a bullet that goes through any bulletproof vest and goes right into the heart. And it hits a person and it can change their life. My words and your words can't change anybody. But when Allah puts power in our words, He decides one time for this one person, it could be a million people watching this video. But there's one person sitting there that these words will reach and Allah decides it's going to change their life. And He can. And if Allah doesn't say that, it, we could talk till we're blue in the face. We could, Nuh is probably a much, definitely a much better, better speaker than we'll ever be. He's talking for how long to the same audience? 950 years, nothing changes, right? Which means for us, we can't quit reminding. And we can't quit re remembering that Allah is the one who changes people. And motivation is like that, it'll come over time. Like Omar, my favorite example, Omar mm -hmm. radiallahu anhu, was five years after he became Muslim. The Prophet started delivering his message for five years. This guy was not Muslim radiallahu anhu. The question is, what was he doing for five years? We understand how he became Muslim. That's a later story. But if you ask what's he doing for five years, you could basically answer that with one word. Partying. The guy's going out hunting, horseback riding, beating up some dudes, drinking. This is what he was doing. He was busy partying. So if you call him, hey, have a, let's have a discussion about the purpose of life. Or about the afterlife. Or... I gotta go shoot some spears or something, you know what I'm saying? He was busy. There are people like that even today. Hey, you wanna go to a lecture? Nah, man, I gotta catch a movie. No, nah, this is a game, it's game time. It's Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. It's football time. It's whatever, you know? People have things they're doing. But you, have, you can't give up on people like that because Allah describes their hearts like a rock that's got water inside. And you keep tapping at it and you tap at it and you tap at it and eventually a little tiny crack. And when that crack happens, water comes out water just like comes faith out. comes out. Yes. It's just like that faith comes out. So some people, it's easy, they just completely transform overnight. And for some people, it takes a long time. And we should be respectful of that and not give up on those kinds of people. Keep knocking on the heart. Hopefully yeah. that water will come out. I actually tell you a story, a friend of mine. Hold, 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 okay. hold don't, don't lose your I'll place you right there. Okay. We got saying we got to go to break. Don't lose your place. We're going to hear about the story from the friend and more of your questions being answered here in the Dean Back here on the Dean Show with the CEO of Baina Institute, Noman Ali Khan, and please continue where you left off. Yeah, so I was telling you about a friend of mine, mm -hmm. uh, going off of the example of the heart that takes the time to open up. Yes. So this friend of mine, his, his mom was Christian, dad was Muslim, and he was raised a Muslim. And his mom, I mean, he's now almost 30, just did not accept Islam. She just stayed on her religion, the religion of her parents, uh, very devout Christian. 
And little by little, little by little, little by little, and in th after 30 years, like 29 years, she became Muslim. I mean, she was a Christian when he was born. And for 29 years, he knows his mother as a Christian. And at the end of the day, eventually, Allah put something in her heart and it opened. You don't give up on people. You keep making dua for them, you keep striving behind them. And this is not an isolated story, there are lots of people like that. You know, we think when we give somebody a reminder and they don't change right away, that, man, this guy doesn't listen. She doesn't listen, she doesn't care. We don't realize, when you say something to somebody, it goes inside the ear, it's like, a, it's like getting exposed to allergies, it sits there and after a while you react, right? Mm -hmm. It's like that, it could sit there and simmer and simmer and simmer and eventually, it comes out as Islam. That's actually what happened with Omar, the story of Omar. He heard Islam way back, early on. He heard it from the Prophet himself. He tried to beat up the Prophet one time before he was Muslim. He hid behind the veil of the Kaaba at night time. The veil is black, the Kaaba is black, and he's hiding behind it. It's completely invisible. There's no night lighting at the time. And the Prophet was praying and he hid behind it until he snuck right in front of the Prophet. So the Prophet doesn't even know that he's praying, that, uh, that, that the, guy, the guy's hiding behind the veil. He's about to jump out and attack him. The Prophet was praying and reciting Quran. And he recited and he thought, Omar is listening to the Quran and he thinks to himself, this is beautiful. Wow, he must be a poet. He didn't say it, he was thinking it. And the Quran says, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرِ It's not the word of a poet. The Prophet didn't hear him, but this was the next verse that he was reciting, the next ayah that he was reciting. Omar said, how do you know that? He must be a mind reader. The next verse, next ayah is, وَمَا, بقولي, وما هو بِقَوْلِ كَاهِنِ It's not the word of a mind reader. قَدِيلًا مَا تَذَكَّرُونَ How little you like to remember. How little an effort you make to truly remember. Tanzilum min Rabbil Alameen. It's the revelation from the master of all worlds. So he's thinking it's just in his mind. He's praying, reciting the verbatim word of God. Yeah. And these are coming out. These are coming out. And he's hiding behind the veil. The Prophet doesn't even know he's there. He got so terrified, he ran away. That's actually not the day he became Muslim. He just he was so shocked by what just happened. He came to attack the Prophet ﷺ. He ran away. He, he became Muslim much after that. But you know what? The first crack had already been caused. And it only gets bigger and bigger. Like a dam, you can't cause a crack, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like that, you know? So we shouldn't underestimate the words of reminder. People might dismiss it at the time. A lot of times people dismiss advice because they're too full of pride at the time. If I try, try to tell my sister something, my cousin something, my uncle something, it's, come on, don't bother, don't, don't waste my time. They don't want to look like they're listening because it might even be, why should I make you feel like you won? I had to listen to you. Who do you think you are? And maybe once you left, they're like, yeah, he was right, I should have listened to him. Mm -hmm. But they can't let you see that because it's a matter of pride now, right? It's okay. Don't, you don't, we don't have to give people advice and they transform their lives. Because that transformation is not up to us. But we do have to continuously remind. This is the teachings of all prophets. Prophets didn't see change for decades sometimes. And Allah, what's the advice Allah gave to our messenger? So I said, you're not going to find a better speaker, you're not going to find a better message, you're not going to find a better audience that understands the message directly, the, the Quraysh. Imagine people that hear the best message from the best teacher for 10 straight years and still don't listen. Can you imagine? What an impossible audience. What does God tell His Messenger? Just keep reminding. Your job is just to remind. So it's not our job to convert our or job to change convert. someone's uh, uh, heart. That's on the Creator, but ours is just to... Sincere... Sincere, considerate reminder. Considerate means you care about that person. You're not just there to tell them they're going to hell. You're not there to tell them they're wrong. You care about them, like you care about your own child. You care about your own brother. You care about your own, you know, and they're in the sense your brother too, because you have the same father, Adam alayhi salam. So they are your brother and your sister in humanity. You know, that this, that's the reason Allah told us we come from single parents. So we think of each other as family. So it's that caring concern. A lot, of, a lot of times people give advice in a way that's very insulting. Yo, sister, you're not wearing hijab. Don't you know that's in Islam? What kind of Muslim are you? That's how you would, if your mother wasn't wearing it, that's how you talk to her? There's a way to talk to people, right? This is what the prophets taught us. How to talk to people. Not just what to say, but how to say it. How considerate we have to be in delivering a message. Because that can soften people's hearts. You know? Laynu uh, al Qaydu uh, al the, the Arab says, the softness of the hearts can become the prison of the hearts. You soften somebody's hearts, that's like, it's like they're in your pocket now. You own them. An nas abidul ihsan. They say, people are enslaved to excellent behavior. You, be, you behave excellently with someone, and they are yours. 
they're yours. This is what the Prophet was, it was excellent with people. One of my favorite stories of the excellence of the Prophet is uh, when he conquered Makkah, when Allah gave him victory in Makkah, the custodian of the, the Kaaba, you know the Kaaba has a key. Yes. That was a mushrik. Mm -hmm. And he refused to give him the key. I'm not like him. It's Muhammad. If I knew Muhammad was a messenger, I would have given him the key. He's not a messenger. I ain't giving him the key. So one of the companions grabbed the keys from him without telling the Prophet. He grabbed the key from him, gave him to the Prophet to open the Kaaba. They opened it, he prayed, etc. And they're coming out. And an ayah was revealed to give the key back to the mushrik and apologize to him for taking the key from him in that way. And when he saw that behavior from the Muslims, he became Muslim. Amazing. <laughs> Incredible. Like Allah revealed to the Muslims, at the time of victory, these are people that were torturing you. And they, he didn't torture him or kill him or stab him, he just snatched the key from him. And the key doesn't even belong to him, he's a mushrik. It doesn't belong to him. But Allah didn't like that and ayah comes down. And that's the ayah actually I shared in khutbah today. Inna Allah ya'murukum an tu'addul amanati la ahliya. Allah commands you to give the rights to those who deserve them. Oh my God. This is a great example of mercy. M mercy, courtesy, respect. Some of the great people that the people that the people look up to, Alexander the Great or some of these other war uh, uh, hungry people, they would have chopped the man's head off. Yeah. Can you imagine? He gave the key back. It's, it's an unprecedented scenario. Look at how the Prophet said, there was a Jewish girl, she died, a young girl, she died, and her funeral profession, prof uh, procession was walking by. And the Prophet was sitting and he stood up out of respect. And some of the companions said, that's a Jew. And he said, well, she's not a human. <laughs> he had courtesy for all human beings, Ali Sattva This is what Muslims have to learn, to be courteous to each other, and to be courteous to all humanity, respectful. This is how you invite people. Now, let's talk about this word for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. The word da'wah. The word, we use the word da'wah, we have to give da'wah to Islam, we have to give da'wah to Islam, right? Da'wah literally means invitation. Now, outside of calling people to the religion, have you ever given somebody an invitation to your house for dinner? For lunch? Come over to my place? We'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk. Is it possible you insult someone, make someone feel little, insignificant, worthless, and then invite them to your house? And even if you did, would they come? <laughs> it's impossible, isn't it? The very word da'wah means that you have extended respect, courtesy, kindness to somebody else, so much so that you're ready to invite them to your own home. That's what da'wah is. If we forget that basic meaning, we're not able to carry this message to anybody. We're not. It's not about the arguments, it's not about proving whether God exists or not, or whether this is correct or that's correct, or this text or that, that, all that's later. All that stuff is later. The first thing is an attitude of inviting people to something beautiful. Just like you have a wonderful meal at home, I want, you to share, I want to share it with you. There's plenty to go around. And what an amazing meal. The more we share, the more it increases. Instead of going down, you know. Mm -hmm. That's why I want you to share. I want more for myself and more for you. That's the beauty of this religion. And we Muslims shouldn't lose sight of that. And it's very tragic that we're losing sight of that. Let's, uh, we're going to take another break. Sure. We'll continue on with another question. God willing, inshallah, here in the Dean Show, don't go nowhere. <laughs> This is the Deen, Deen of Islam This is the Deen, Deen of Islam Back here on the Dean Show with Noman Ali Khan, the CEO of Baina Institute 
and we're going to continue on. We've got some questions here. One of them, which is, I have a hard time grasping the concept of final decree, Qadr in Islam. Qadr in Islam. Uh, several ways. I mean, um, this can never be a short conversation, as you know, predestination. If God already knows what I'm going to do, how is it my fault? If God is all-powerful, then I'm not really doing anything. Somebody else. And, and if someone has a hard time understanding that, um, you know, if, it, if it's the first problem, it's, if God's under complete control, then I can't be held responsible. If somebody was having a conversation like that with me, the first thing I'd do is slap him. So why'd you slap me? It's like, it wasn't me, it was God's decree. Mm -hmm. well, uh, you can't blame me for that because it was predestined. <laughs> that wouldn't work. <laughs> Would they buy that? Would they be happy with that? No, not no. at all. Because now I'm saying it's not my fault, bro. It's God's decree. They even know that at a practical level this makes no sense. They know that. But you know why they believe it? Or they want to believe that? Or they want to argue that? Because they want to do some bad things and they don't want to be held responsible. Just like I just did something bad, and I wouldn't really do that, but I'm demonstrating. <laughs> that they don't want to be held responsible. That's the, that's the psychological root of this problem. The second thing I'd share is, I have a lecture online somewhere, I don't know how everything I say ends up on YouTube, but I have a lecture there somewhere, on the story of Adam alayhi salam. Because the Qur'an does not make a chapter out of decree, rather the Qur'an teaches the lessons of decree from the story of the first human being. Teaching us that if there was, one hum if there was any human being that had the right to ask, hey, you already knew I was going to end up on earth. What do you mean I ate from the tree as punishment, I got to go on the earth? You already knew all of that. If there was any human being who could have argued God's decree is entrapment, who could it have been? Adam alayhi salam. We learn the solution to this problem in the Quran from Adam alayhi salam and his story. So that a careful study of his story little by little is very important. And at the same time, you know what shaitan said? Oh, you planned this whole thing against me. Ah, you made me slip. So the one who says God decreed me to slip is who? The devil. The devil. The one who says, I was the one who was wrong. Rabbana zalamna anfusana. We wronged ourselves. Not God wronged us. We wronged ourselves. If he doesn't forgive us and show us mercy, we'll be from the losers. The one who admits his own fault is Adam. The one who refuses to admit his fault and says it's God's fault is... The devil. The devil. That's what we're learning in the first human being story. No surprise, they call this the oldest problem in philosophy. The devil wants to continue what he... His failure, he wants to... Inflict, inject that virus into us. It's the oldest problem in philosophy because that's shaitan's problem. Predestination was shaitan's problem. You know? The third thing, if somebody is really philosophically inclined, you know, some of our, use, uh, our listeners, our viewers, um, they can understand simple arguments and that's enough for them. And mm -hmm. some are very, very deeply philosophically inclined and they like to read, you know, deeper literature on these kinds of things. For them, there's a book I recommend. Um, a friend of mine, actually, a, a senior in our community in Dallas, uh, wrote the book, he's a sociologist, an anthropologist, a Muslim scholar by the name of Salahuddin. He wrote a book called God, Islam, and the Skeptic Mind. I think it's a fantastic book. I read it on my trip to London, I had nine hours to kill. And it's, it's a collection of discussions that college students had with him about their, you know, skepticism of belief in God, predestination, sharia, etc., etc. And he collected all of them in one book. And just a transcript of those conversations. It's very, very well done. I really appreciate it, and it, I think for like, especially college students and, and uh, you know, students that start having problems with Islam philosophically once they take a couple of philosophy courses in college, that book is a great, great resource. What's it called again? God, Islam, and the Skeptic Mind by Salahuddin. We were with our brother Chris, and I don't know if you remember, and he asked the same question to you. We were having lunch, mm -hmm. and you gave an analogy, a story. Can you share that with us? Do you remember that? Sure, now? I remember the A and the B. Yes, the two yeah. lists and the party. Yeah, yes, I can share that analogy with you. Um, that's actually the way my teacher explained it to me because I used to have the same question. And, you know, people differ different people are satisfied different ways. I was satisfied with that explanation. He was satisfied with that also, yeah. Okay, so I'll share it with you. Now imagine that I'm throwing a party. Yeah. And I make two guest lists, people I'm going to invite. Guest list A and guest list B. Guest list A, I... Just, it's secret. These are the people I'm going to invite, and nobody knows who's on this list. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. It's a secret list. Guest list B is open. And I say to people, if you want to be on B, here's what you got to do. I give them a few to-do lists, and if you do these things, you can get on guest list B. Now here you are, you want to come to my party. You got two options. Maybe I'm on guest list A, I don't know. 
Or maybe I should try to get on guest list B. If you say, well, I'm not going to bother trying to get on B, I'm probably already on A. You know what that proves? That proves you didn't really want to go to the party that bad. Because mm -hmm. you're gambling, aren't you? But if you say, you know what, maybe I am on A, but maybe I'm not. But I really want to go to this party. What should I do? Whatever tasks there are to get, guarantee my spot on guest list, B. This is basically how guidance works, predestination works. Allah decides who's going to go to hell and who's going to go to heaven. There's a secret list. But there's also an open list. Do this, 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 you, got, you get on guest list A. And there's some people Allah decide to guide, they're over here. Amazing thing, you get to the party, guess what you realize? Your name is actually on both lists. And all the people who signed up on B were already on A. And all the people that didn't sign up for B weren't on A either. Meaning Allah's, Allah mysteriously guides some people, but those are the people that do the right things anyway. Allah mysteriously decides some people don't deserve guidance. Well, you know what? They're the ones who actually don't do anything to deserve guidance anyway. So both of those things. In philosophy, you could say it's God's will and human effort. They come together in Islam. They come together. And the way they come together in the Qur'an, where this whole thing comes from, is actually one word in the Qur'an. It's in the Fatiha. Iyaka nasta'in. We say the word Iyaka nasta'in, which translates your help we seek or only your help do we seek, you're probably sure you've heard that translation before. The word nasta'in in Arabic is important here. Different kinds of asking for help. I'll very quickly explain. If I had a flat tire, and I sit in the car listening to the radio, you walk by and say, hey buddy, could you help me change the tire please? I'll pop the trunk for you. And I sit in the car while you're changing my tire. That's asking for help, but that's a pretty retarded way of asking for help. Now imagine I had a flat tire, I got out myself, I pulled out the jack, I'm trying to crank up the car, but I'm not strong enough. You walk by and say, hey Eddie, you look like you work out, come on, help me out over here. I put effort in, and then I asked you for help. That's called nasta'in. Asta'inuka, I'm putting effort in already, and now on top of that I'm asking you for help. You know what we learned from that? The only time you and I have a right to ask Allah for help is when we do what first? Put effort in. If we don't put effort in, we have no right to ask God for help. This is what Allah does over and over and over again. The companions go all the way to the battle of Badr. The angels arrive after that. The angels are not there ahead of time saying, Hey, we've been here since 3 o'clock, where have you guys been? No, no, no. You've got to make the effort first, then the help arrives. What happens with Ibrahim a.s.? He's thrown in a fire first, then it's cooled. Human effort first, Allah's help later. But both of those things come together. And that's essentially what predestination is. Once you put the effort in, Allah's, Allah's decree is that you will be guided. Last minute that we have for our brothers in humanity, the not yet Muslims, and even the Muslims who now they've been away from Islam, yeah. and they are coming back. They watch some of our shows, they like what we have to say. What advice do you give to them, to the not yet Muslim and the Muslim, some of the basic things they can do right now to get back on track, or to get on track? Number one, you are in, in the opportunity of a lifetime. I mean, Gosh, if you make tawbah now, if you repent to God now, and you change, you just, you don't even do anything yet. You just sincerely turn to God and say, I'm turning back to you. I'm going to change my ways for you. Then you are in a better position than any scholar, any worshiper, any Muslim on the planet. Why? Because your slate is entirely clean. That's what tawbah is. And not only that, Allah adds another incentive. Maybe you have this endless mountain of sin behind you. And you're wondering, how could I just get rid of all of that? God's promise, He takes those mountains of sins, فَأُولَيْكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّعَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ Surah Al-Furqan, 25th Surah. Those are the people, the ones who sincerely repent to God, or turn, turn back to God, He will take all of their endless mountains of evil deeds and convert them to good deeds, just because they repented. So not only are you starting at zero sin, you're starting at billions of good deeds, because all of your billions of bad deeds have actually been converted, just from that one act. This is the opportunity you're sitting on. And Allah knows the one who procrastinates, the one who holds back. And Allah describes that person on Judgment Day, and that person says, they're about to go into paradise, and a wall is dropped. And they're like, what happened? We were going to come. And the, one of the first responses is, وَلَكِنَّكُمْ فَتَنْتُمْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَتَرَبَّصْتُمْ You put yourselves on trial, you, you kept yourselves from coming forward, and you procrastinated. You said, ah, I got some time. After this weekend, one last party, then I'll change. One more Ramadan, then I'm good. One more, well, just a little bit more. Just a couple more semesters, and then I'll stop. You were the, you were the people that procrastinated. So, well, it's dropped. 
You can't be from us anymore. So this is the opportunity you have to avail now. You, have, you and I have no time left. There's no time like now to make, make tawbah. So don't, don't think you have time left. I shouldn't think I have time left. This is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to, I mean, look at him. His status compared to us. He used to make tawbah to Allah. He used to repent to God, ask Allah for forgiveness hundreds of times every day. For what reason? Because he knows. Even all, first of all, if a mistake has happened, it's converted to zero. And all the mistakes are turned into good deeds. Why not ask for forgiveness all the time? Great advice. Thank you so much for being with us, for finding the time. Inshallah, we look My forward pleasure. to have you back again. So happy to be As here. As promised. Again. Inshallah, yes. Inshallah, thank you. If I'm in Chicago, I've got to come back. Yes, Inshallah. yes. Assalamu alaikum. And beautiful advice. Beautiful advice. While you have life, before death reaches us, take that time now to repent to seek forgiveness from the creator of the heavens and the earth, ask for guidance as the creator of the heavens and the earth has said that all of my slaves are misguided unless I guide you. This is what the creator is saying. You can't be guided unless God guides you. So ask for his guidance. Ask for his guidance. And then be courageous enough when it comes to you, when the truth comes to you, to be on the truth, to live on the truth, and to die on the truth. Give us a call, 1-800-662-ISLAM, if you like what we have to say, to ask some more questions or to begin the verbatim word of God, the Quran, we're here to help. Tune in every week here to the Dean Show. Until next time, peace be unto you.